um, assalamu alaikum everyone. Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Maria and I'm the communications officer at the Aziz Foundation. If you've never heard of us, where have you been? Uh, the Aziz Foundation is a family established foundation that is currently focusing on giving scholarships to British Muslims to uh, study master's courses. Um, this year we've expanded our strategy to include um, to cover master's courses in the areas of, and bear with me here, policy, law, media and journalism, creative content, tech and sustainability. Um, and our scholarship cycle will open from the 11th of January in the new year. Um, we look forward to receiving all of your applications. We've also done a couple of other things a bit ad hoc. Uh, we supported the Dean Developers, which some of you may have heard of. We have um, supported uh, tech scholarships for the Islamic makers um, in co collaboration with Love Circular and the Makers like Academy. Um, so we've got a few projects here and there, um, but our main focus is scholarships. Um, and Wasila here is one of our esteemed scholars. Um, Wasila is actually alumna, uh, an alumnus now. Um, it's been a couple of years, I think. Um, but great to be joined by her. Um, so Wasila completed her undergraduate at Lancaster in Religious Studies, winning the Angela Belson Prize for Best Dissertation on Islamic Topics. And she's recently completed her MA at Birmingham in Global History. Um, now, I'm personally a fan, having done a history undergrad. Um, she's also a singer, a songwriter, a classically trained musician and a music production enthusiast. Um, Wasila also makes teddy bears when she's bored, which I think is like the best thing ever. Um, so over to you, Wasila. I'm really getting tired of the sound of my own voice, so very excited to hear this. Hey, um, thank you, I guess. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I, I am Wasila. And yeah, this is this is my sort of my child before everything that I've been studying for the last five years, and I'm very excited to share it. I've, I've never got to talk about this in a public space, mostly because I mean, if you are in Muslim spaces, we kind of know that it is not the friendliest of topics to just bring up and say, this is this is what I study, this is what I do. Um, and so I have spent a lot of time trying to understand why that is. Uh, just as a quick disclaimer, I can't actually see anybody on the teams, all I have are my slides. So yeah, if you need something, I think Maria is going to tell me that there's something going on. Um, so yeah, music in Muslim cultures. I didn't realise when I started studying this that this was going to be one of the most intellectually rigorous, socially complex, politically free, like politically fueled, hilarious, outrageous, and just impossible thing I hope I will ever read. Um, so I ask as sort of my audience if you can just keep a very open mind in terms of what you think about Muslim history right now and what you think that music in Muslim cultures looks like, because I can guarantee it's not the case. And I say that like coming into it as a musician, coming into it thinking that I had a clue, I had no idea what it was that I was about to study. But I guess the first question is, why is it even important that we're going to have this conversation? Like, why can't we just leave it as it is? It's just, you know, it's just music, why does it matter? And I think it matters because of this, you know, within the last few months, you know, the, the Taliban entered Kabul and the groups of musicians that were there in their new conservatoires that they just established, they fled and they fled for their lives. And the Taliban are not the only regime within a, an Islamic space or a Muslim space that terrorizes musicians. Now, it seems kind of arbitrary in the bigger picture of why is it that you would start a new political regime and one of the first groups that you would target aside from women are musicians and artists. So, you know, they went around, they smashed a lot of pianos, they, you know, tore drum skins, but they seem to have based all of this violence and, you know, they were, and murder, they seem to have based it on some sort of political thought and theology that they have traced back a thousand years or even further than that to the Prophet Sallallahu Now, we also look at you know Islamic history and Muslim history, and we can also see that although there are occasions where musicians have had a really rough time of it, 
there is also this enormous flourishing culture where music in Muslim spaces has influenced music across the whole world. Every Muslim culture has its own, either in a worship sense or a folk music sense or an art music sense. So I want to sort of tease out these contradictions and explore how we've got to this point, how we've got to the point where when you establish a new Islamist regime, the first thing you do is start killing musicians and oppressing women. So music, when you study it, and this is the, the subject is called ethnomusicology, when you study it, it's because it's more than just sounds. It's more than just reading notes and putting together an orchestra. It's filled with social meaning. And that means that, you know, it's not just that people put their emotions into the songs that they write. It's also that music is influenced by the politics and the economics around it. So you can use music very interestingly as a case study for broader issues. And I didn't realize that that would be what it was that I was doing when I started studying this, that I was about to study a history of gender and slavery and violence and economics. And it all comes together and it all informs why the Taliban would come up with such policies. So just some common terms that in Muslim spaces you might hear about music. But the first thing we need to acknowledge, especially if we're going to look at music historically, is that the word music in Old Arabic, not modern Arabic, but in Old Arabic doesn't exist. So music in the Western sense, the arrangement of sounds or you know, some sort of harmonic, harmonic put togetherness, orchestra, that kind of stuff, that as a concept, an overarching umbrella term, doesn't exist. You have musiqi, which refers to the study of music, the science of music and musicology. You might have things like nasheed or rina or huda, and all of these are separate genres, and only rina is considered to be music in any way that would resemble the Western sense. All of the other forms like nasheed or huda, like camel songs, folk music, they are not actually considered music within early Islamic conceptions of music. So if we're approaching music in that sense, we need to sort of understand the intellectual landscape that early Muslims are approaching concepts of music with. And fundamentally, it is a Greek, a Greek worldview that they are looking at music. Um, I'm not a mathematician, I'm not going to pretend that I understand much of this at all. But we do need to know that when people studied music in Sort of early Muslim societies, they studied it through the curriculum of the Greeks, through the quadrivium, where they looked at, I think it's like physics and maths, cosmology and music all together as one discipline, and they were all related. So what we see here in these really fabulous diagrams is a sort of Pythagoras's work that scholars have built on and built on, where he looked at the distances or the supposed distances of the seven heavenly spheres, what they believed surrounded the earth. So you have earth at the bottom, terra. And the ratios between each sphere is the interval of sound that you would then get on a lute or a lyre. And so the Greeks tried to align their tunings of the lyre and all of the strings and the frets to the universe, and it was part of the cosmology. And the Muslims carried on with this study, perfected this study, perhaps, with scholars like Al-Kindi. And they even took these ratios and they put them into all sorts of art, like architecture, calligraphy, into other forms of science as well. So this is where music starts when we're looking at it in a Muslim space. They're looking at it as a universal harmonic thing, where it's a reflection of heavenly harmony, what humans try to make whilst they're playing chords and trying to write songs. Which is very different than how we look at music in the modern sense, you know, it is just song, verse, chorus, verse. Like, this is a, a, a deeply spiritual and cosmological endeavour. So then we have our key scholars, Al-Kindi I've already mentioned, and he was one of the first to build on the, on the Greeks, and he translated a lot of the work during the Abbasid period. But his focus was on the ethical, cosmological and therapeutic. We see a lot of the therapeutic work, like music therapy, and it's very common now within different forms of therapy, but we also see it in the Ottoman world. They had a lot of, they like to put music therapy into a lot of their medicine. There was a scholar I came across as well, a Hindu, and he's a physician, but he also did a lot of writing about how 
it was important for physicians to have a significant amount of musical knowledge themselves. So either they themselves could play modes or they could work with a musician to align the modes and align the music to the ailment of their patients as a way to cure them. And it worked um, especially with sort of mental health and we still use it now for mental health. Um, but it's something that the Greeks started and the Muslims continued and yeah, we, we still do it now. We also have Al-Farabi and his Kitab al-Musiqi al-Kabir is without doubt one of the most influential musical or musicology books in the whole world. It introduced a lot of Greek music theory into Europe and you know, some would argue that it brought about the Renaissance in music in Europe. And yeah, so and then he built on the Kindi and who built on the Greeks. And then you have our final two who are actually quite new to me. So al Umrawi, who developed lots of vocal forms, many of which we still use. Um, a lot of the Arabic vocal forms with the sort of the trills and articulations that especially you get in the Gulf, um, mm. they developed in this period, as well as new instruments, new modes, yeah. and adding an extra string to the oud is part of this cosmology, sort of perfecting that harmony. And then finally, we have the abjad notation, so we, which you can see on the right. Now, to me, I'm a sort of Western musician, I have no idea what this says, um, but apparently it was very popular and it was a way of, you know, as sheet music is, a way of communicating song, which is quite unusual considering in the Arab world, a lot of music is oral and people learn it by listening. But using this, you could spread songs you know, from the furthest Western borders all the way to the Eastern borders which is also why you have some music, you know, that's a thousand years old and everybody's singing it exactly as it was, which is very cool. In this particular um, notation, however, you also see sort of markings that were only used for Tejweed, sort of for an recitation, which is what became a, a debate in and of itself. So if anybody reads music, you know, this is Western music notation and you know, we have musical scales here, so the one on the left is in G. But what you can see is a melody, but the words that are being recited in this case is the Qur'an, because Qur'an recitation was part of musicology and they sort of influenced each other. So within Islam, we know that the Qur'an should be recited beautifully. And part of that beauty was reciting it with maqams and in harmony. So all of the you know, particular articulations and ornamentations that they had developed as musicians and in musicology building on the Greeks and various scales, they brought into Quran recitation, which is also why when you travel across the world and you listen to different Quran reciters, you get different scales. So each culture has its own particular sound for its own particular recitation. Which personally I find just completely delightful. And it is also why music is so powerful because these sounds have meaning within their particular culture. On the right, we have um, the Adhan, which similarly, it is recitation or cantillation. It's not considered music, but both of these are distinctly melodic and they're all part of this musicology. So that is a very, very brief introduction to musicology, I guess, and music in the Muslim world. Are there any questions before sort of move on into the history? If you have any questions, just feel free to um, use the function and um, we'll just go from there. And it's fine if you don't have any questions at this point as well, and you're just kind of learning new things, because I'm, I'm definitely doing that at this point, just like taking notes on the side. Um, if anything occurs to you while Wasil is talking, um, yeah, definitely just pop it in the chat box. And when there's another break, we can go to it at that point. OK, should I move on? I mean, I can't see anything, so. Yeah, I think we're OK to move on. Um, okay. Yeah, any questions, just put on the chat box. OK, um, so this is what I was actually working on when I was writing my dissertation this year for my master's. Music as survival. So because there were so many debates that developed and because the culture of music is so complicated, there were a group of women called the Qiyan that I'll, um, that I'll get to who were 
very much you know they were they were very much caught up in everything so music in the prophetic period was a women dominated practice which is very very different to how we look at the middle east today where we you know there are lots of issues with women being secluded in the prophetic period women were very much at the fore so within this practice you have um Hindarutba, the wife of Suleiman, the leader of, of um, the Quraysh, and she would be leading war chants. She would be at the front leading musical congregations. And even after she became Muslim, she carried on doing this. You also have, however, and I'm sort of being very careful with the words here, when you say a woman-dominated practice, you had the Mekhenneth. Now, the Mekhenneth were male, um, but they were called the effeminates, and you have artists like the Wais, who you'd sort of consider to be the first Muhammad within a Muslim space, and he was considered effeminate because he was a musician, not necessarily because he sort of displayed any femininity beyond that of a musician. It's just that it was such a women-dominated space that if you were a professional musician as a man, you were let, therefore labelled effeminates. The effeminates sort of take on a very different connotation by the time you get to the Abbasid period. And they sort of become matchmakers and sort of like court jesters and that kind of thing. But in the prophetic period, as we see in the Hadith, they are you know, very much just people who do things that are usually considered to be female. But music was very important in the prophetic period. There were a lot of festivals, there were a lot of mejlises. Um, one of the most interesting ones I have found was a sort of fate just after the Prophet Sallallahu died, a fate where um, Jamila, who was a slave woman, a seeing slave woman, that she led this enormous entourage on her way to Hajj for pilgrimage from Medina. And they stopped off at sort of every tavern, essentially, to have a sing song with every community on the way. But most of the songs were things like camel songs. So camel songs are named as such because they are the songs that people would sing whilst they were riding their camels in a caravan or doing trade. The Mecca was a central trade route. Um, so whilst they were on the camels, the sort of very stable rhythm of a camel plodding, that would be the rhythm that people would use to sing songs as they were going on these very, very long journeys. And then with Rina, which is art music, which is what um, Jamila, the singing woman, would have sung, these arrangements are very simple, usually a cappella, maybe there would be a duff or like a drum, perhaps a lute, but it's very simple music at this point. And because music was so common, there's actually not very much of it in Islamic sources. You know, the hadith are there as you know, sayings of the Prophet, because they are remarkable. It talks about things that are unusual or exceptional about the Prophet or about that period. So the only people that we do see really about music in the Hadith are these women, the Qiyan or Qaynat here, where it says, do not sell, buy or teach singing girls and the price paid for them is unlawful. It's very condemnatory, kind of very clear, but very interestingly, not condemning the Qiyan, but the system of slavery that brings these girls. And then we also have another one where Aisha, she was, you know, it was Eid, and she had two girls, Jariatan, Jariatan meaning slave girls from Jaria. And they were singing a folk song about the Battle of Ba'ath, but she's very, very specific, and she says they were not singing girls as a professional group of women. So then my question was, within my thesis, who are they actually talking about? Who are, who is, are these institutional, institutionalized singing women? The Qiyan, the singing slave women. So this took me down a long road looking at this wonderful text called the Kitab al-Aghani from the 10th century. And it's one of the very few places that we find biographies of women. And in these, these women in particular, because they were slave women, they were exceptional, you know, they're not free women, but also because they were musicians, they were also visible, which is quite different in the fourth century of Islam or 10th century when al Isfahani is writing the Kitab al-Aghani. So the Qiyan were a specific institution of slave women. They were picked from when they were children, to when if they displayed a good singing voice or particular beauty, 
They were then trained in specific art. They were trained in the Quran and recitation and history and culture, just all round entertainment kind of to become a courtesan. And you know, this followed Byzantine traditions. And then these women were sold to you know the highest bidder. They weren't necessarily sold on sold on slave markets. They were sold in private settings. Um, the Kitab al is very interesting, where it shows sort of poetry as advertisements for these women. As yeah, so they were tended to be sold to wealthy families or to taverns and brothels where they would hold salons. Now these salons were sort of very indulgent, very sort of very much a kind of sort of club feeling. And we don't actually know all that much about them because they were very private. All we know is that the Qiyan would flat with people. They would play a lot of music. A lot of this music was very sensual. They would, you know, their trade was in jealousy where they tried to string along as many patrons as possible. So they would receive a lot of gifts from these patrons, which would then pay for, you know, the you know the hiring of the tavern or the brothel or pay for the family and then pay for their training so the qiyan you know to be a courtesan you had to keep on top of all of the you know the current trends in music the current trends in fashion and jewelry and the patrons all of their gifts would be used to pay for that training some qiyan were not actually slave women though um jamila used to be a slave woman but she gained her freedom and she, you know, she liked being a Qiyan so much that she carried on, held her own salons. She became a teacher and you know, she held festivals and was altogether very influential in that art space. So what we notice here as well is that when we're talking about slaves, slavery in the context of Islam is very, very different. We're not talking transatlantic slavery. We're talking about ownership but within a space where they still have some sort of agency, some amount of ability and capacity and not as labor. I think the best example would be the Ottoman slaves in the Ottoman court where you have the Devshirme, where you've got a group of men who are slaves, but they are also very powerful. Though many of the Devshirme became the viziers or the second to the Khalif. Many of these slaves also owned their own slaves. And in the case of women, the concept of slavery were different in as much as because the slave women were sexually available, they had the ability to become unwelled. And Islam provided these extra protections for slave women, where well, if you become pregnant or if you, you know, give a child to your master, you are instantly freed and you have to be protected by your master. And you're therefore no longer sort of slave in that sense. So for slave women, this was the best route to stability. And many of the Qiyan stopped playing music when they became unwelled. However, just because Islam brought about significant changes in slavery and sort of took away a lot of the potential of abuse and things like that, it doesn't mean that the slave women themselves were treated any better within the literature. So there are lots of literary tropes around slave women because of the jealousy and the sort of the entertainment that they provided, where they were sort of known for being for being able to possess men and control men. Um, one of my favorite stories has to be between Hababa, uh, the slave woman of Yazid II. She was a Qiyan, but Yazid II was so besotted with her that when she died because she choked on a pomegranate seed, Yazid II apparently sort of lost his mind and his entire his entire kingdom dissolved because he was so enamored with Hababa and then he died shortly afterwards. Now, nobody blamed Yazid for the fact that his policy started to fail. They all blamed Hababa and the literature is not very kind to her. There's also the trope of the reformed slave of this woman you know, who goes from making everybody jealous and being very, very flirtatious in these salons to choosing the pious life. So here are some wonderful pictures that I found. Um, sort of most of them are Ottoman or Persian. It's very difficult to find art from sort of the early Islamic period, but describing a majlis and what it kind of would have looked like, where you've got sort of dancers and musicians all sitting together in a circle. There tends to be a lot of wine drinking, a lot of very interesting conversations. Um, but yeah, this was the peak of sophisticated entertainment.
so the as we've seen in the hadith the qiyan were known and although it, they didn't the hadith never actually explain who they are or what they're doing there's something innate within the hadith that sort of point to the fact that these people are not people that as good pious muslims you want to be around so the khulafa al rashidun when they they started their rule after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam died some of the first things they did was close down the taverns and the illegal use of slave women as prostitutes. And this was part of the biggest issues surrounding music was the fact that the qiyan were often found in spaces where there is illegal activity, specifically sexual slavery. Islam prohibits the use of sexual slavery in as much as anybody is allowed to sleep with a slave woman. It is a privilege preserved only between her and her master or her and her husband, and then the master has no access to her. But within a brothel space or a tavern space, these rules were often flouted. So the Khulafa al-Rashidun, they closed down these spaces and you therefore, by extension, music is also oppressed. There are also a few very specific examples are actually related to music. So Khalifa Omar was known to have flogged any companions who listened to Rina, so people who went to these salons and who listened to these slave women and you know, sort of surrendered themselves as the literary trope where you surrender yourself to the powers of these women. And then Imam Ali as well, who found fault with Muawiyah, who would become the first Umayyad Khalif for keeping singing girls. Muawiyah owned singing girls. And throughout the literature, especially in Abbasid literature, it's like it's a very continuous thing of Muawiyah is a bad person because he owned singing women. Whether or not it's historically true, we can't quite figure out. But just in general, we can see, therefore, that being around singing women is very bad for your reputation and being involved in Ghanair as a whole is very bad for your reputation. And that's the focus of the early criticism, the association that music has with illegal activity and illicit activity, not necessarily the music itself. Which brings us on to the Umayyad period and Ma'awiyah. So I'm not going to go into all of the political conflicts that led to the Umayyad period and the establishment of that dynasty. But what we can see is that this is the, the part where we can sort of notice that the actions of the Taliban find their roots in the actions of certain Umayyads and then continuing into the adversive period. So I'm just going to stop there quickly. And are there any questions about the prophetic period before I carry on. I actually had a question, if no mm -hmm. one else did. Um, you know, you described um, the the sort of the standard medjlis, um, mm -hmm. and how there'd be kind of, you know, entertainers and, and drinking wine and having like, you know, debates and chats and stuff. Was that during the prophetic period or was that before um, the message kind of spread. Was that amongst Muslims or was that uh, amongst the um, the Quraysh? Yeah, um, I'm going to say both. So I think what's very interesting about music and culture in general is that even though you know the Quran comes and it changes a lot, it doesn't change a lot of the ways that people socialize. And it's very strange and kind of a difficult thing that I found to come to terms with that these practices continued. I think they quietened down a little bit during the prophetic period, and especially you know when there's when sort of taverns and things are being shut down. But the majlis and people drinking, I think as we will definitely come to see in the Umayyad period, it was actually quite consistent, which I personally find kind of alarming as the historical narratives go. Actually, makes sense. Yeah, no, it made complete sense. Interestingly, though, following from um, that kind of question and answer, um, Abdul Samad um, asks a sort of like similar question. Um, first, he says, thank you for this interesting topic. Um, and do you think what fueled these people and these societies to engage in and like flourish in music was more due to their ethno cultures or more due to Islam? If it's more due to the norms in their cultures, for example, in Middle Eastern cultures, why do we identify them by their religious identity? So why do we say... Muslim cultures and how they engage with music instead of saying um, music in Middle Eastern cultures? Um, yeah, um, complicated question. Um, 
I would so this is my my case study, which is why I'm sort of looking at it as Muslim cultures because this is in this particular bit the formative period. And one of the odd things is that you can also trace this majlis and like this this musical situation, you can trace it to wherever the Muslims went. So a similar case study can be found in Andalusia, which isn't the Middle East, but um, they have their own sort of rena genre and their own slave women. And you can also follow it into India, you can follow it all the way to Indonesia. So yeah, it's kind of an odd one that sort of this Middle Eastern musical culture spreads everywhere and does become on some level the Muslim musical culture, at least within Rene. There are obviously lots of lots of different folk traditions and lots of different changes in that sense. In terms of what drives it, then yeah, there is this sort of thing that with Arabization, that becomes Muslim because it is the practices of you know the Muslim elite that are bringing Rene. Yeah, it kind of they kind of become synonymous and inseparable. But that is also one of the issues with studying culture that they you know they grow together and it is very difficult to separate the two as like a Muslim thing or an Arab thing. They become a Muslim Arab thing and then also a wider Muslim thing, if that makes any sense. So is it fair to say that like cultural practices will spread with Islam, given the fact that the people spreading Islam had a particular culture and they would settle in that area and they would marry from that area? Yes, and that with music, you also get the politics and the elite and all sorts of other things. And music is kind of infectious. I think it will become a lot clearer in the Umayyad period. I think as you sort of see the cross-culturalism and things develop, I think you know, my answers are a little bit fluffy. Um, no, it's great. Please, yeah. It's so interesting. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, anyone else have any questions, just drop them in the chat box. Shall we move on? Okay. Um, so yeah, the Umayyad period. So within the Kitab al-Ghani, it's one of the few places that you find case studies, as I've mentioned. So I found a particular chapter talking about this particular slave woman called Salama al-Qis. So she was born somewhere in the first century. We don't really know when. Um, she's described as mixed race, so possibly sort of generations of sort of African slaves coming into the Middle East. And so a lot of the slaves within Medina especially were mixed race because it was licit to have relationships with, with slaves. Um, so yeah, she belonged to the Quraysh noble. She was a very well educated singer. And she also did a lot of rec recitation and knew a lot of history. And she was one of the most famous Qiyan in Medina at that time with Jamila. And she was part of that entourage. She was then later bought by somebody who would become Yazid II. But before that, she experienced state censorship. So this is the sort of moment where you kind of see a break between just shutting down taverns to an actual specific, we need to deal with music itself. So this is an extract from the Kitab al Ghani, from her biography of a run-in that she had with Rahman bin Hayyan al Murray, who was governor of Medina. So when he arrived, he was told that he needs to rid the city of corruption and perversion and reform it and purify it from singing and adultery. Singing and adultery here, you know, as we've seen by association, singing and adultery come together in very particular places where you'll also find Rene and where you'll also find Rien. It's a very particular sort of demand from, from the population. So he announces, therefore, uh, Marie says that he is going to give three days for all of the people involved in Rene in singing and adultery to leave Medina. So the Qiyan are panicking, naturally. They're about to be exiled from their home. But Ibn Abi Atir, he goes to the governor, and he's known to be a quite a pious man. And he goes to the governor and he says, what would you say about a lady whose craft was singing, who was compelled to do it, then left it and devoted herself to prayer, fasting and doing good? And then Uthman said that he would let her stay if she did that. So 
yeah, this was a moment where you know it's possible that okay, we've got one Rien and she's allowed to stay if she's done this. But Ibn Abi Atiq has a plan and he wants to keep all of the Rien in Medina. So he says to Salema to bring a rosary with you and to display humility, you know, dress modestly, keep your head down, and we're going to go to Uthman and we're going to make a point. So she goes to Uthman and she spoke to him. And she impresses him with her knowledge of you know, people and biographies and even his own biography. Because as Qiyan, they were very well educated in history and culture. And this was part of their institution as entertainers, that they were very, very intelligent women. And then Ibn Abi Atiq says, well, recite the Quran. So she does. As we've sort of mentioned that within this musicology and recitation, they sort of come together. So you actually learn, and this is still the case, you actually learn um, Quran recitation whilst you're learning music. So she is an excellent Quran reciter. Then she can also sing camel songs. And, you know, Uthman at this point, he's just marveling and he's, you know, he's absolutely you know, completely besotted with Salama. And then at the end, she is asked to perform Rina and perform her song. And the song she sings was about modesty and piety and humility. And then Uthman, you know, he's like, he's so besotted with her that he just says, no, we're going to completely renege on the policy that I've just put through and all of the Qiyan are allowed to stay. And this is a kind of a humorous story and a story that is slightly common within, you know, in terms of its tropes within the literature. But it is also suggestive of a lot of other things. So I remember Hayyan Murray, you know, we can find a lot of his biographies in Dubbery and other histories where we can definitely see that in this case, the crackdown on impiety was performative. He himself was, you know, he was an aristocrat. He was part of that whole culture. Um, but when you arrive in a new city and you need to tell everybody that this is going to be a really pious city, you need to get rid of the most visible impiety and that happens to be the Qiyan. Um, but it was very common that musicians were thrown in prison, that you know, closing down pubs, and that everybody would shun music publicly, but in private, the sort of trade would still thrive. Now, Al Tabari is also very revealing in terms of the character of Amuri, where he was, in terms of it being performative, he was most definitely not doing it because he meant it. He was later flogged for drinking, he lost his position because of slander, and yeah, it was kind of very well known that he was part of that Qiyan space. But then you sort of look at it, look at the story within its broader political situation. So al Muri in al Tabari, you kind of see him giving these really, really big violent speeches saying that he is going to make the heads roll, the heads of Iraqi dissidents roll. Because by, 17, by 714, Medina has lost its geopolitical relevance. The Umayyads have moved their capital to Damascus. And there is a really, really big war going on in Iraq. And al Hajjaj, the governor of Iraq, he has recommended to the Khalif at this time to put al Muri in Medina to control the dissidents. He's not necessarily there to control piety. He's there to control the political authority. But part of political authority in the Umayyad period is also piety. You need piety to have legitimacy. And legitimacy also gives you spiritual authority. So the Umayyads are still at their infancy at this point, and their power and control is very, very fragile. They're constantly being invaded, for, being invaded from all sides. So holding on to that spiritual authority by displaying piety, by getting rid of the Qiyan, is probably a very good idea if you're just about to start ruling as governor over Medina. However, it doesn't explain why, other than the visibility, or maybe perhaps a you know, short economic disruption of the trade. But it doesn't really explain why the fixation would be on the Qiyan. Surely you could you know, put sanctions in against people who are buying the slaves, as the Prophet ﷺ commented, that you that it's the, the trade in slave women that is haram, not the women themselves. And within the Qur'an, this is also supported. So there's... The Qur'an disrupted the trade in as much as it brought about a lot of new laws that meant that sexual slavery was only illicit in certain spaces, as I've mentioned. But there was also a very interesting point within Surat and Noor in this area where it's, do not force your slave women into prostitution if they desire chastity. So the Qur'an acknowledges that there is coercion within slavery, 
but it also acknowledges the ability of slave women that Islam gives slave women the space to assert some amount of agency over their chastity. Even if they can't necessarily escape slavery itself, they are allowed to have some agency over their own bodies. However, the exegetes from the Abbasid period, and we can kind of assume a continuity, they didn't look at it as a thing where women are being forced into it, into sexual slavery. They looked at it as women choosing to be in prostitution kind of situations because you know there's obviously you know that they refuse to acknowledge the coercive nature of it so obviously she chose to be there therefore it makes sense that the Qian would be censored because they are you know involved in adultery and singing of their own choice sort of refusing to acknowledge at all that becoming a slave is not a choice and slave women do not have this kind of autonomy that you know, in an ideal world Islam would give them and we can see the realities of this where most Qiyan or Khayna, when they did actually achieve freedom, if they either bought their freedom, which was given freedom for other reasons, or they became unwelled, most of them became recluse and they were never seen again. Because being a Qiyan was not an easy position. You, you know, there are lots of stories of Qiyan being raped or sexually abused or generally, you know, sometimes they were drowned whimsically, sometimes you know, they experienced the most abhorrent violence, but they had absolutely no choice in this. So within the Umayyad period, sort of within the limitations of the of the text, we can see that the reasons for the censure are not because of music itself, but for the association that music has, Renet specifically has, with broader illicit activity. For politicians, if you take away the visibility of this illicit behavior, it can give you legitimacy. For the pietists, the people who are asking you know, to, you know, to remove all of this visible, this visible sin, the censure is in line with the Islamic ethics, but it kind of ignores the reality of slavery and the facts and the reasons why the Qiyan exists. The Qiyan are there because of the slaving system, not because they're there by choice. And then what we also see are the realities of the lives of the Qiyan and slave women as a whole, that they are consistently threatened. And as Salama shows, she has to use all of these skills that she has to survive. She was threatened with being thrown out and many, many other slave women were thrown out, beaten or worse. And it's only through being able to charm the powerful men around them that they manage to survive. Now, this is a trend that continues and only gets worse as we enter the Abbasid period. I'm going to stop there again if there are any questions before I sort of move on. Anything? Okay. So the Abbasid period between the Umayyads and the Abbasids is a point of huge cultural change. And the cultural change occurs from this enormous influx of wealth and expansion um, that forms the Muslim golden age. So we've already seen that you know, this involves a lot of music theory and cultural developments. You know, Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, all of these scholars, they're all within this golden age of great patronage, great knowledge. And it's a very good time to be studying. This also moved into performance, so the performance became much more sophisticated than we had in the prophetic period, which was very, very simple. We've got the development of the oud and the addition of the fifth, fifth string. We've got also the changes of rhythms and a preference for happier melodies. These changes in rhythms and melodies comes from this broadening and this influx of wealth, where you've got a lot of Persian influence and the, virtu the virtuosity of Ibrahim and Mosuli who you find throughout the Kitab al-Aghani is like, this is you know, him and his son, they are the best musicians around. But Ibrahim al mosuli also establishes a systemization of Qiyan training. So previously it was kind of sporadic and people would sort of train them in this bit or this bit or this bit. Now we have schools for Qiyan training because they were such a lucrative investment. You could buy a slave girl who was pretty when she was young, and by the time she was a teenager, you could literally sell her for, I think I read like 30 or 40 times the amount 
So the Qiyan were you know, this huge investment and they became therefore only the domain of the elite. It's very, very rare that you'd find them outside of the court or at very elite medjlis. They're no longer really in sort of brothels and, and that kind of sense, unless you know, somebody had a lot of money there. Um, but because of that, they were also they also became experts in bankrupting men, using their skills to bankrupt men in order to continue and, and thrive as artists. But there is also a sort of shift in terms of gender that I'll come to in the next slide. But you now have a class of male musicians, not mohanna, but actually like men who are identified as masculine. And they tend to have a very low social status. They're kind of banned every now and then. Um, the Kitab al gives a lot of stories about how, you know, sometimes even though they were promised a certain amount of silver or gold, people just decided not to pay them. Sometimes they would go to court about this and the judge would just look at them and just go, no, I'm not going to give you the money because you're a musician. She also meant that they were regularly humiliated. The Khalifs could be very, very cruel if the lyrics that a musician was singing were not very good. And this applied to the Qiyan as well. There was a story of a, of a Qiyan where she got the lyrics wrong and she accidentally insulted the Khalif. And she very, very quickly changed it, sort of on pain of death where she managed to survive and then she fainted in the middle of the court because of you know, just how scary it is actually being a Qiyan in that space. An exception to this is Ishaq al-Mosili, however, the son of Ibrahim al-Mosili, where he was not just a musician, but also a theologian and considered to be a very, very pious person. And to the shock of everybody, he would often enter the theological majlis in the palace holding the hands of the chief qadi, the chief judge. And, you know, usually people would expect a musician to go and join the other musicians at the back and the other artists at the back. But he actually sat right in front of the khalif and it shocked everybody. So piety gives you this sort of ability to jump between statuses, especially if you're a professional musician. And professional musicians were looked at as like the absolute bottom in terms of the society. Like you must be seriously immoral if you're a professional musician, was the general feeling. And then again, you also had occasions where the court didn't have any music at all. Um, Khalif al-Mahtadi was an occasion where all music was banned, but his reign was very, very short. And then the musicians came rushing back in with the patronage as well, the moment he died. Now, very importantly for the Qiyan in this, in this period is the gender change. So women were very visible, as we've seen, you know, musically very visible during the prophetic period. But by the time you get to the Abbasid period, free women are no longer seen in public, in elite circles especially. So Hind, if she were alive during the Abbasid period, she would not be on the battlefield with a drum egging everybody on in the battle. Elite women were sort of, they were kept to the harems in their homes. They tended not to be as educated or, or as accomplished as slave women either. So because the Qiyan went through this very, very rigorous training, when it came to establishing relationships, either getting married or just being around men, they couldn't compete with the Qiyan. And for the men, in a situation where because slave women were the majority of the interactions that men had, you end up with a very, very ugly power dynamic where women are objectified, they are disposable, and you sort of you you get the kind of feeling that with the Qiyan, because they can outcompete all of the free women, that they also compete amongst themselves for that power that they can hold over men. For the men themselves as well, what you actually end up with, with in the words of Leila Ahmed, was this kind of endorsement and license of misogyny. And these same men who were in the court, these men who would only slave women they were also the people who were writing Islamic law at that time, at the very beginning of the formation of law, which is why you tend to see the sort of descriptions around the law around women are not always as sort of kind as they should be and can be very, very misogynistic. And it would make sense if the only women that they ever spoke to were slave women. But this created a space where slave women could fight for the power. The free women can't compete because they do not have the education and they are not visible, whereas slave women 
are visible because they are slave women. They have the privilege or you know, questionable if it's a privilege in the case of the Qiyan, that they are visible. They are allowed to talk to men and therefore they are allowed to or have the ability to manipulate men, which is kind of the, what became their living. The most successful of these manipulations is in the literature is Khayzuran, and she became the consort of al-Mahdi. And this was only possible because all of the free women have been locked up and put away, but there's also a succession crisis. So in the Umayyad period, even though the children of slaves are legitimate, they couldn't inherit the Khalifate, whereas in the Abbasid period, they changed that and they could. So this meant that if you become an umwalid, you were also about to become the mother of the Khalif. So there was a lot of murder, a lot of poisoning, a lot of intrigue in the harem as they tried to, as Qiyan and slave women tried to outcompete each other to become the most influential over the Khalif. But because the Khalif is the only person who is allowed in the harem, they all of the politics and intrigue that happened in the harem, the other courtiers and viziers they weren't involved in. So they were hated. Because the, the, the Khalif would go into the harem with a decision already made and come out of it with a completely different decision, having been influenced by all of the slave women in the Qiyan in there. Khayzaran was a very exceptional woman, where upon realizing that she had influence over al Mahdi, she managed to study on extra things that she knew that al Mahdi was interested in, I think specifically sort of theology and law and politics. And she managed to get him to change the line of succession. So Al-Mahdi was married to his cousin, who was a free woman, and she and he had children with her. But she managed to make it so Al-Hadi, her son, and Harun al-Rashid would inherit the Khalifate instead of his first Al-Mahdi's first wife. This naturally caused a lot of ruckus at the court, and Khayzaran was much hated by everyone. But she also wants to get her grip on power. She was also not necessarily stable. As I've said, there was a lot of murder and a lot of poisoning. And it's suggested that she even poisoned her own son, Hadi, because he didn't let her have as much influence over politics as al-Mahdi did or as Harun al-Rashid would before she died. So what we see is that slave women have moved from being entertainers in brothels to being sort of a nice addition to the up and coming Umayyad court to becoming queens and political players in their own right. And all of these changes become very apparent in the textual criticisms. And this is where, as modern Muslims, we can like, come to understand what the debates were. So, previous to the Abbasid period, you, literature was only just beginning in the prophetic period. We don't really have much literature at all. And most of the literature that we have about Islam come from the, um, the Abbasid period. So the two earliest texts and the two surviving texts that we have about music specifically are the Dham al-Malahi by Ibn Abi Dunya and the Risalat al-Qiyan by al-Jahid. Both of these men are courtiers, both of these men are great teachers, and they are also very familiar with the Qiyan, with the Renat culture and everything that's going on in there. Ibn Abi Dunya, his work, which I'm not going to focus on, but his work is essentially just a list of hadith very carefully arranged. And it's not supposed to be taken as like a great legal treatise, as many modern scholars have looked at it. It's not that at all. It is almost like a, a, a satirical pamphlet of a particularly ordered hadith to suggest to people that what's happening in the court isn't quite right. Whereas the Risalat of Qiyan is an excellent piece of literature. Um, it is a satire, very, very cleverly placing itself right in the middle of the of the culture as we will have a look. So the Risalat of Qiyan is a satirical commentary. And rather than being very explicit about saying, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And al is, is, you know, he's first-hand viewing everything that isn't quite right about the culture. He writes it satirically from the perspective of the Nuqayyinun, the Qiyan's owners and their patrons. And rather than focusing on the music, he focuses on the behaviour of the women and their patrons. 
the Recherche of Rien is one of the places where we find lots of information about how the Rien would create jealousy, how they would sort of manipulate and get gifts out of their patrons. But we also see, and Al Jahiz is very subtle in how he puts this together, how they justify their misuse of Islamic law to misuse sexual slavery, to misuse the Qiyan by finding loopholes in the law. So Al Jahiz kind of describes this very, very careful sort of performance that gives the appearance or the shadow of illicit behaviors within the Mejlis, where essentially you know, they have stewards and chaperones, so nothing illicit could happen. He sort of writes very sarcastically. And everything is done properly, that at no point are the, are the singing girls on their own with these men, and at no point is anything improper going on. However, if jealousy, or tarab as they put it, sort of comes to such a point where the the men could no longer control themselves, they were given the option of either engaging in a temporary marriage with the Khyan, or they could buy the Khyan, have sex with her, and then sell the Khyan back to the original owner for a lesser price. But because both of these options are legal in Islamic law, you know, temporary marriage became quickly illegal, but temporary marriage and owning a slave woman as illicit sexual options because they were illicit it therefore meant nothing illicit happened at all and the whole industry surrounding the Qiyan was perfectly fine. al Jahiz is writing this in complete irony and is just highlighting the commercial opportunism, the moral distance between proper ethical interpretation of the law and sort of the very obvious this is the misuse of law and it is entirely unethical versus a legal supposedly legal, but very unethical interpretation of what is essentially thinly veiled prostitution. So al Jahiz, if you put this literature within the broader literature that al Jahiz has, he is writing about and commenting on legal method. The Qiyan are a very visible example of how this, um, of how legal method within this period is being hotly debated. And it's a very good example of how legalists within within the debate perhaps get it wrong or at least al Jahiz argues that they get it wrong so people are probably very familiar with the traditionist rationalist debate the hashri Murtazili debate that i'm not really going to go into and i'm absolutely not a theologian to even sort of scratch the surface of the intellectual thought that's going on there but the qiyan through al Jahiz's commentary find themselves between you know between both sides of this argument. So the ulama and the new scholarship that is being established in the Abbasid period, they are presenting challenges to the Khalif's spiritual authority. The Qiyam, as we've seen under Athman and Muri, they are a very visible representation of a serious amount of impiety. And the public know that this is happening, even though the Qiyam are seemingly kept behind closed doors, either at court, or in elite salons, people know what is, what's going on. And it's undermining very much the spiritual authority of the Khalif, especially when there are new authorities developing every day within the ulama. So the Khalif, as everybody knows, does not have the piety anymore to have spiritual authority. And even though al Jahiz is trying to defend the, you know, defend his position against the traditionists that we find in the ulama, it doesn't really make much difference to what happens within the musical space. So the Khalif, therefore, you know, in trying to, you know, in trying to keep some sort of power and some sort of control, now that they don't have the spiritual authority because of their own behaviour, they carefully appoint judges to support the Khalifate, and therefore they can kind of sort of get away with continuing their malpractice at court. This, however, changes with the Mihna. You know, the Mihna, literally the trial was a point in the theology where, well, a point in sort of the conflict between the traditionists and the rationalists, where um, Mahmoun tries to, Khalif Mahmoun, he tries to enforce a doctrinal position on the ulama regarding the creativeness of the fan, which was a central, a central issue within the debate, breaking with the usual position of the Khalif not imposing on the ulama and sort of sitting back, sort of using the new institutions of the judge and the Qadi and 
sort of and the ulama in general to administer and legally administer and regulate the regulate society. But because the Khalif, you know, Imamun in enforcing the Mihna, which is essentially an inquisition, and accusing favorite scholars of the public, and I think there was a lot of violence, especially to Imam Hanbal, who was beloved by the Baghdad population, the Khalif is essentially entirely delegitimized. He becomes a purely political figure after the Mihna, and his spiritual authority, even though it was only a little, is now left at none. For music, this means that public moral regulation and who is regulating music and who gets to decide what is halal and what is haram is no longer in the hands of those people who used the qiyan, but in the hands of the orthodoxy and the populism. Which is a significant change from how we've got Uthman and Murray in the Umayyad period, and he is is very much part of the state and he is regulating it on behalf of the public, we're now at a point where the public is regulating it themselves. The most important figure within this musical space, in Baghdad at least, Imam Ibn Hanbal, and he is very interesting in how he actually does approach the musical topic. It wasn't something that we actually see a lot of until a little bit later in the four schools of thought. Um, but he disapproved of frivolity and he himself was very much aesthetic and part of that whole movement against the sort of overindulgence of the abbasids in general. And he criticised Renat because it distracted from good living. Therefore, in his responsa, he writes guidance of breaking instruments and pouring out wine. Again, that association between music and illicit practice. Although he himself never actually did that, he was known to be a very quiet man. So he didn't, it was sort of just his advice and kind of guidance, but he didn't do anything like that at all. But his thought was very common within the ulama as a whole, and the ulama as a state institution now is regulating public morality. It's not the khalif, it is you know, sort of the qadi and all of his different departments, including the muhtasib. So the Mahdasib I would kind of describe as sort of like the judges intern, and a lot of them would later become judges, we sort of found, and they had these sort of hispa manuals. Hispa meaning those concerned with upholding of religious and moral probity. So when so when the when they the Mahdasib would go into public and they would see that there was something going on, like very visible. Um, musical practices that they didn't like, especially women playing music, they would go out of their way, perhaps smash the instruments, getting and get rid of the music practice in public if it was disapproved of. But this sort of, yes, Maria, it's fine. Um, yeah, so this sort of comes to, you know, the result of all of this, however, it becomes the Hanbali Vigilantes. So as much as you know, authority has moved from the state and it's now in the hands of the people, and with all of the economic disruption that we also find during this period, the Hanbalis became very, very violent. So they would go into the quarters in Baghdad where the new musicians lived and the Payan lived, and they would cut the strings or you know, smash the instruments of musicians. They would stand outside of houses if they could hear singing, reciting Qur'ans. Sometimes, and you know, most famously, they would conduct enormous raids where they would almost like destroy and, and break the houses. I think there was some murder sometimes, especially under the guidance of Al Hari, where he did sanction the beheadings of some professional mourners. Sometimes they were appeased, like Al Qahir, um, but in the end they sort of died down. Except the thought, the, the Hanbali thought, and the, that sort of action becomes very common in the literature and something that we read about very commonly, but it was still a minority. Which sort of brings me to the end. And I think what I was trying to get across, and I hope I kind of did, was that music is an intersection of lots and lots of different things. It's not music itself that was ever really under fire. It's the, pol the political and social disruption around it that creates an opinion around Renat specifically that was the problem. But because Renat was, you know, its practitioners were singing slave women, they were the most visible and most vulnerable. It also makes it so the criticism was very gendered 
And that gendering and the misogyny comes out very much in the theology that was written since then. So if we're going to approach the conversation about music, it's very important that we understand who it's being written against and who it's being written by and what that actually means to music. So in the modern sense, you know, the only question that I really want to ask, you know, even though you know, slavery and misogyny and abuse and violence, it's all there, as well as the politics and everything else. My big question really is that considering they weren't actually talking about this umbrella term of music, they were talking about something very specific and they were talking about very, very specific practices, even within Renat. What is it that in modernity we're actually trying to say is halal or is haram or even broader, why are we having the conversation? Because we no longer have an institution of singing slave women and we no longer have within sort of a, especially in Muslim spaces, I hope we don't have this kind of corruption and misuse of slave women within musical spaces. So it raises a lot of questions going forwards and a lot of a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, some recommended readings if anybody wants them. But yeah, thank you for listening to my me geeking out about my favorite thing. Um, if, are there any more questions? I think we're just wrapping up. Um, Nev, I think. Hello. Thank you so much. I I loved your your talk. It was really informative and fascinating. Thank you. Um, I just have a question about uh, the relationship between um, the cosmology and other forms of art and uh, mm -hmm. music or musicology. Um, I don't know if you have any recommendations or sources, uh, particularly in relation to architecture. Because, um, I mean, my I understand that there was some research about Ottoman mosques and how they were actually designed um, for the uh, Quran, yeah. the particular Quran recitation that, that was happening at the time. Yeah, um, I think that part of it is very new to me and it's not, it wasn't the focus of my work, but I've recently bought a book that I have here, um, Music, Sound and Architecture in Islam. It's a sort of ethnomusicology and it talks about all sorts of parts of, you know, the oral geometry and how that works within architecture and stuff as well. So I'm just starting it and it, it's really quite fascinating. It seems like it's going to be a good one. Well, thank you so much. Would you mind, um, could could you say that again or uh, type it in? Yeah, the... I'll just type it in the group. Thank you so much. Um, um, I think there are a few questions on the chat actually. Um, um, I'm enjoying the Christmas music that's coming from um, yeah. Ali, I thought uh, I'll put a pause on that for now. Do you want me to read them out or? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just sort of go through them. Um, information on Al Andalus. I didn't get my dissertation had to be cut short, so I didn't get to sort of go into everything that I wanted to. Um, there is a scholar whom I'm just going to call Gordon. Um, and that's his specialty. He, he's written a lot about that. Um, I think he is actually in the, the my bibliography. He puts a lot of, um, I'll get that for you. He puts a lot of 
um, his work based on that, but he's also written this compilation of sort of lots of different aspects of slavery and music and it's all sort of within that the sort of genre that you're looking for is I think it's called Nwesha. Um and Ibn Hazm also has quite a lot of interesting occasions where he's sort of defending slave women against sort of all of their abuse as well it's sort of quite interesting. Um, Uncle Boom yeah, Uncle Zoom is very interesting in that she, like with a lot of conservatoires, uh, even today, Uncle Boom and Fairuz, even though Fairuz isn't, isn't Muslim, when they start musical training, they learn Quran first because it is a very significant part of performance. And the techniques that they have in sort of Muslim musicology, it is, you know, it's part of that space, which is also very interesting. And Uncle Zoom supposedly didn't want to become a singer, but she became a singer because men wouldn't give her a space to be a Quran reciter. Uncle Thun, also very interestingly, there was a film where she stars as Salama Uqis. It's a very sanitized version of her story. I think it's available on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting sort of modern take on, on the Qian. And I think the last question with Hanbali's monolithic on the spectrum. Yeah, so I think when we look at the Hanbalis, especially because you know, we've got a lot of history within the four schools of thought, when I look at the Hanbalis, I'm very specifically referring to um, sort of the people who were the direct followers of Imam Hanbal himself, and they weren't monolithic. So most of the, you know, the vigilantes, you know, they were a minority. The Hanbalis, you know, they were still very much connected to all of the other schools of thought at that time, and they were their emphasis was on piety, not on going around and beheading poor singing women and and mourners, which is very unfortunate. Um, yeah, so I'm I'll definitely have to say that I'm not not a jurist at all. I'm a, I'm a historian, so I can't tell you about whether or not his opinions would be considered liberal now but within the music space I know that his um, his opinions were very much a kind of a very formative in terms of how we think about music within jurisprudential spaces as a whole if that answers your question anything else or I think we're I think we're done There's a okay. Sorry, I missed the beginning of the discussion. Did you mention where we can find more of your work? Is your dissertation available to read? Um, my dissertation isn't, but I am. You know, now that I've finished everything, and I, I feel a little bit, just a little bit confident about what I'm talking about, but increasingly less so the more I read. Um, I'm planning to put it up on a website so I can actually sort of explore much more broadly. Like a lot of the stuff that I've actually said here, I couldn't put in my dissertation. Um, yeah, but also sort of tying it into my own music work and everything and sort of creating a, I hope would be a sort of new intellectual space for sort of music and musical practices, I think is very much needed. Um, I think if it helps, it will sort of all be up on here. Oh. Is it okay to ask where I raise a hand? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alternatively, can we have an email address? Questions I can send later. I really appreciate this insight and understanding. Thank you for sharing your work. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just put it. I'm putting it all in the chat. So there's most of the stuff I put up, well, will put up is on Instagram. I know we're recording this, so we can sort of catch up on things later. Um, um, and our free yeah, is recorded. Okay, um, well, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us. Um, thank you so much, Lucina, for giving your amazing talk. I feel like I've learned so much. I've got so many notes. I'm just going to have to like sift through them. Um, yeah, just getting a few more thank yous in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the space. It's nice. Of course. So good. We're, it's completely our um, pleasure to have you, and inshallah, we'll have you on for another Scholar Seminar in the future. Inshallah, inshallah.